This lecture will be covering the structure of genes and chromosomes, uh, and this is sort of a, a high-level view of DNA. Um, next lecture, we'll be going into uh, a little bit more of, of the details, uh, it, looking at actual you know DNA sequences and, and that sort of thing. So probably going a little bit quickly through this this section. Um, just because the details, uh, they're not, we're not focused so much on, on, on sequence level details. All right. okay, this is chapter 24 from our book. Um, some of these slides are from a different book, which was chapter 9, so that's, you know, kind of why the, the numbering's different here. Um, what we'll be talking about is the organization of this information into chromosomes, uh, how DNA supercoils, how it's able to pack in so tightly, and the actual structure of a chromosome. Uh, DNA is a very big molecule. Um, if you look at, and, and we'll see some examples of this, but when you look at the size of DNA, like the length of a DNA molecule in a given cell type, uh, it, it's really quite a bit longer than the cells that it goes into. So it has to be organized and compact um, very tightly to, to fit in these, these um, cells. And that's where we get this term of chromosome. And that's when DNA is coiled and tightly packed, uh, usually with the help of proteins. Um, we call this a, a chromosome. Uh, this figure from our book uh, shows a virus that infects bacteria cells. It's called a bacteriophage, and this one's specifically uh, bacteriophage T2. Uh, and that's shown here in the middle. Um, the DNA has spilled out here uh, in this electron micrograph. We can see the DNA, and it's this, this what looks like a string. So you can see how long this molecule is compared to the size of the, the virus that it fits into. Okay. Uh, DNA uh, has a secondary structure. Uh, we typically think of that as the B form of DNA. Uh, we've talked about that um, uh, in nucleotides when we covered those. Um, that would be the secondary structure. There's also tertiary and quaternary structures of DNA as well. Okay. And all of these structural organizations lead it to be very tightly packed okay, and that's because it has to be uh, this link here will show uh, exactly how dna fits into a virus it's a atp motor uh, it uses atp and it, it kind of packs the dna in um, very tightly so if you're interested in that you can click on that link um, all these links will be in the, the description below. Right. Uh, the table 24.1 from our book shows a, a number of different uh, bacterial bacteriophages and really don't need to know this specifically. Uh, what, what's interesting though is they give the size of the DNA uh, and the, the size, as you can see, ranges drastically. Um, and then the length of the, the viral DNA, okay? Um, then what's interesting, though, is to compare the length of that DNA to the dimension uh, of the viral particle. So the, the long side of the viral particle shown here, you can see that they're much, much smaller than the length of the DNA. So the DNA has to be um, tightly compacted to be able to fit in these, okay? Viral DNA is usually um, very small compared to other, you know, bacteria DNA or, or obviously human DNA. Um, it can be single-stranded RNA or it can be DNA. Uh, it's often circular. That's kind of a theme we'll see in viruses and in bacteria. So bacteria um, uh, DNA is organized into one chromosome per cell. Okay, it's circular DNA and it's duplex, meaning it's uh, double double stranded. 
Okay. And in this, you have one copy of each gene. Right. Uh, some organisms, you actually have multiple copies of each gene, uh, as in eukaryotic cells. Right. Eukaryotic cells, um, the, the real difference here, uh, in, in eukaryotic cells, there can be varying numbers of chromosomes. Uh, the, the thing about eukaryotic cells that's really interesting uh, is that they have introns and exons. Right, so in the in the gene encoding regions of the DNA, there are these sequences called introns, which stands for intravening sequences, and there it's actually a sequence that gets uh, it gets expressed, but it gets cleaved out before the messenger RNA is translated into protein. So it's it's you can kind of think of it as um, just like a, a junk sequence almost, um, although it, it's not really um, junk, but just a sequence that's inside a gene that does not get turned into the protein that the gene is going to become. Okay. And if you look at just how much of the, the human genome encodes protein, it's only about 1.5%, which is a very small amount. Okay. If you include the introns in that, uh, it goes up to 30%. So you can see that the intron, uh, the amount of introns uh, in the genome is, is actually quite high. It's higher than the, the number of exons or the regions that are getting turned into protein. Okay. There's also, uh, if, if you take that away, that's, that still leaves about 70% of the genome, um, right? So what, el what other things make up that? There are things called transposons that uh, are actually movable sections of DNA. Uh, single, uh, simple sequence DNA that have you know very um, simple repeats, uh, also can be called satellite DNA. And then you have the centromere and telomere regions. If we look at bacteria first. Right. How do they store the DNA? Well, again, it's double-stranded DNA. It's circular. Okay. It's a single chromosome. Uh, it's bigger than the, the bacteriophage chromosomes. Okay, So it's bigger than the virus uh, DNA. Any extra chromosomal DNA, uh, sometimes that you can have some extra chromosomal DNA in a bacteria, and we call that plasmid. Those are smaller circles of DNA. And in the, the biology or, or biochemistry laboratory, we take advantage of this by actually introducing these small circles or plasmid DNA into bacteria cells to make, for instance, to make a, a protein, express a protein that we want to purify. Um, that's how uh, it's historically uh, done. Almost all DNA... Uh, is in a gene or a sequence that regulates a gene. Okay, so you don't have, in a bacteria, you don't have this same uh, amount of um, DNA that is not for expressing a gene or regulating a gene like you do in eukaryotic cells. Right, and here we have a picture of a uh, E. coli cell that has been, um, the DNA has been let out of it. And the arrows here are pointing to some of these small circles that you get, which would actually be plasmid DNA. And the, the genome of the bacteria cell itself, the chromosome, is this much longer uh, piece that's kind of coiled in on itself. Right, eukaryotic chromosomes are obviously much larger than bacterial chromosomes. Uh, and the DNA length uh, in a typical eukaryotic cell uh, is about two meters. Okay, so that's about six feet long. Um, and you can imagine uh, if you have, you know, one cell, it, it's very, very small, right? Um, so fitting that much DNA into one cell is, is hard to do. We call it diploid because there are two copies of each chromosome in the eukaryotic cells, or at least most eukaryotic cells. Uh, it's linear, so it's not circular, and because of that, um, you need uh, a way to kind of 
protect the the linear pieces of DNA. Uh, human cells are about 20 micrometers in diameter. Um, there's a, there is a huge range of that depending on cell type. So you can kind of compare that two meters uh, DNA inside a, a 20 micrometer uh, diameter cell. Right. So the number of chromosomes, size of genome, really does not directly relate to the complexity of an organism. Um, most of the, and that's because most of the DNA is not for encoding genes directly. And because uh, of this big length of DNA and the small size of the cell, it has to be highly organized. Okay. And that organized storage partially controls how the genes are expressed. If we look at pictures, the kind of a cartoon description of, of chromosomes, right? We have, you usually see these, you know, kind of rod shaped drawings and you have bands on them and, and those bands are where the genes would be uh, the centromere is there kind of in this not directly center but you know somewhere in the middle and that's where the two copies of the the chromosome which we would call sister chromatids um, those kind of stick together there by the centromere another way of looking at it is like this right, where the centromere is here. So they're sort of uh, X-shaped in a way. And how they really would look, if you if you look under these and under a powerful microscope, uh, are, are shown here. And you can actually um, have the, these kind of analyzed in a, in a lab to, to make sure that, you know, you don't have any um, um, chromosomal deficiencies. Right, so how how we term this is collinear information, and that's because you have two strands of DNA, one going five prime to three prime, and the other strand, the complementary strand, going in the opposite direction would be five prime to three prime. Okay. Right. Um, that is then turned into messenger RNA through the process of transcription. And the messenger RNA is turned into protein through the process of translation. Okay, that, in a nutshell, is the central dogma uh, of biochemistry, which we will be discussing in the next uh, few lectures, uh, at the, the next three lectures at the, the end of class, uh, the end of this, this um, semester. So neither the total length of DNA nor the number of chromosomes correlates with the complexity of an organism. For an example, dogs um, have 78 chromosomes. Um, amphibians have much more DNA than humans do. Um, plants have more genes than humans. So uh, it, it's not a very strong um, correlation there. And that again is because in eukaryotic cells, most of the DNA is non-coding. Uh, the biological significance of this non-coding DNA, it's not really entirely clear. Um, there's still lots of research going on in, in this. Uh, if you think about it, uh, the genome, the entire human genome was only sequenced, you know, fairly recently, something like 20 years ago ish um maybe 25 now um but it's it, it it was you know that that in itself took many years to do the first time uh now now we can do it very rapidly so we've learned a lot uh in that time but still there's a lot of um there's a lot of genes that really we don't know um what they do uh, or, you know, we know there's a protein, but we still don't really know where the gene is for that protein. So there's still, still work being done on this. So the, this non-coding sequences, the significance of those is still pretty, pretty unclear. We know that some DNA regions, uh, directly participate in the regulation of gene expression. 
Okay, those are things like promoters, termination uh, uh, signals, and we'll be talking about those uh, in the upcoming lectures. Um, some DNA encodes for small regulatory RNA, okay, and, and those still don't, we don't uh, always know what exactly their functions are. Um, and some DNA may just be, you know, what we would refer to as junk, and that's pieces of unwanted genes, um, remnants of viral infections, things that are just sort of left over from, you know, a, a different time, but have been incorporated into, into the genome. And, you know, maybe uh, evolutionarily there's a, a benefit to having this junk DNA around. As I mentioned before, there are, if we're looking at genes specifically, there are two parts to a gene. One is the intron, or intervening sequence, and these are sequence of nucleotides in a gene that are transcribed, but cut out before the gene is translated. So they're turned into RNA, but before that RNA is turned into protein, these intron regions are cut out. And the exon, it would be the opposite of that. That's the segment of the gene that encodes a portion of the final product or protein of the gene. And if we look at this, um, it, it's kind of interesting how the, the number of introns in genes can vary widely. Okay, so it's not like um, some consistent recipe it, it it's almost sort of random in a way uh, the two examples here we have two genes and the exons the part that would be turned into a protein product are shown in red and the introns are shown in, in gray so in this gene uh, we have seven introns and that takes into account 85 percent of that sequence of the gene so it's it's a vast majority of this gene okay. here on hemoglobin beta subunit there are only two introns but again it's a, a really large amount of the sequence okay but it, it's not always like this um, histone proteins which we'll talk about uh, when we're talking about the structure of a, a chromosome histones don't have any introns Okay, and a, a l very large protein like Titan, which is a muscle protein, has 178 introns. So the number of introns and, and how much of the sequence they, they compose of a gene can vary drastically. Uh, it has been determined in the, the recently, um, fairly recently, that bacteria genomes also have, can have introns. Um, not something we're going to be discussing in, in this class specifically, but um, just for your information, um, they do also contain some introns. Okay. So if you look at the chromosome, the parts of a chromosome, and we want to show it linearly uh, laid out here, the end caps and the center of it are, are these sort of special structural regions. Okay, the ends, what we refer to as telomeres or telomeres, um, depending on how you pronounce that. I, I like to say telomere, um, but I've, I've definitely heard it's pronounced telomere. Um, and then the middle is the centromere. Okay. And then the gray regions here would be the unique sequences that you have or where the genes are, um, you have a lot of the repeats and um, the multiple replication origins as well. Okay. Centromere is the attachment for, point for proteins that link the chromosome um, to the mitotic spindle. So when the cells are dividing, that's how um, the, you make sure that each cell gets a, a copy. Right, and the telomere, the just the ends of the chromosome, and these telomere sequences help in stabilization, or thought to, uh, the the DNA, unlike bacteria or viral DNA, the eukaryotic DNA is linear, so you have to protect the ends from from unwinding, uh, things like that or breaking off. So that's where these telomere regions are, are helpful. 
We mentioned earlier uh, this thing called transposon, and those are sequences that can move within a genome. So eukaryotic genomes are not really completely static. They have these transposons that can move around within the genome of a single cell. Um, the ends of the transposons do contain these uh, repeat regions, and they account for an estimated 50% of the human genome. So a pretty large amount of the genome are these transposable regions. Right, telomeres are the caps, the end of the eukaryotic chromosomes. And they're thought to form these special loop structures to keep the DNAs from unraveling. Um, they're added by this enzyme uh, telomerase. Uh, in many tissues, telomeres are shortened after each round of replication, and thus the cellular DNA can age because of that, right? And it's thought that one of the reasons we age is this telomere shrinkage, and there's research going on to actually study this and maybe prevent um, some of the bad parts about aging um, by using, um, by being able to uh, keep the telomeres uh, extended or, or longer. And the sequences that we, we typically see in the telomere, um, the, the five prime end repeats are listed below. Um, three prime end would be complementary. Uh, the, the repeat sequence in humans is TTAGGG, and then that is repeated uh, you know, a certain number of times so for mammals, that, that number is about 1,500 times uh, usually, right? And then again, it, it can get shortened as the, the cell divides. Right, centromeres, those are the regions where uh, the, the two sister chromatids come together um, and where the, the spindle can attach so that the, the daughter uh, chromosomes uh, are held and, and split apart during mitosis. Okay. Um, these are um, comprised of AT-rich sequences um, and repeated sequences of, of close to 130 base pairs. So in this picture, this would be uh, the centromere region. And we don't really go too much into uh, the details of the centromere, only that they're AT-rich regions. But if you want to uh, remind yourself what meiosis and mitosis are, uh, this, this figure is good for that. We won't really be getting too much into the details of this, though, in, in this class. Okay, so how is this DNA packed in? Well, we saw the, the viral DNA, um, and it's... Uh, associated or may be associated with what what are capsid proteins, the, uh, the proteins that are actually comprising the viral particle, the outside shell of the virus. Prokaryotic DNA is associated with proteins in what's referred to as the nucleoid, right? Bacteria or prokaryotic cells don't have a true nucleus, but they do have what's referred to as a nucleoid where that the DNA is kind of packs in on itself and makes um, a sort of a quasi-nucleus. And eukaryotic DNA is organized with proteins into a complex called chromatin. Okay, So this combination of chromosome and protein is known as chromatin. Right, so if we look at a picture here, we have the... Uh, uh, prokaryotic cell shown here, bacteria cell, and again, no nucleus, but this folded up chromosome, um, you know, folded up and uh, probably stuck together with some proteins there, that forms what's known as the nucleoid region. So comparing uh, the structure of DNA, the level of organization, uh, from a prokaryotic cell to a eukaryotic cell. Right, in a, a prokaryotic cell, all you have is this circle of DNA, and it just sort of gets kind of coiled and wrapped uh, along in on itself. 
Well, this figure, by the way, is from a different, a different textbook. Okay. UKR at Excel has a, a much more levels to the organization. So if we look on a, a secondary structure uh, level, that would be shown here. The DNA, and we see that it's in that, that alpha helix, right? That the, the B form of DNA. That gets twisted around these little orange balls here. Those are histones. Those are pro histone proteins. So it gets coiled around those. Okay. Clusters of those then get kind of coiled around each other. And they form what is sort of like a, a helix or a coil, right? And th those coils of the, the DNA and the um, histones can coil again around themselves. And then those coiled coils can be wrapped in sort of a, you know, a bundle together, okay? And that, again, goes stuffed inside the nucleus. So you can see there's multiple levels of organization here within a eukaryotic cell. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about these. Okay. Right, the, the analogy here um, is kind of like a, an old school phone cord. And I don't know if any of you have actually ever seen one of these. Um, so I don't know how good of an analogy this is uh, now nowadays. Um, but the, an old phone uh, cord, you'd have the phone and then it would be like stuck to something on the wall where the keypad was and you'd pick it up and you'd go talk on it. And if you'd be walking around on it, talking, the coil would get kind of wrapped around itself. So it, the coiled cable also kind of twists and wraps around itself and this region where you get these twists around, uh, there's a lot of tension, that's known as a supercoil. And that's kind of a, a good analogy to DNA. Right, just another way to look at this, the figure from the book, we have the DNA uh, alpha helix. Uh, the B form of DNA is what we refer to as a relaxed form of DNA. So this, if it was just circled around um, that B form, that alpha helix being circled around, that'd be termed relax. Supercoiled DNA is when you have this uh, circle actually twisting on itself. Okay, so that's shown in, in this. Okay. So there's some ramifications to um, supercoiling in DNA, and those occur in replication and transcription. Okay, as you, um, it, it will will go into detail about these processes in future lectures. So don't worry about getting all the details right now. But when DNA is is in this case being transcribed into RNA, right, it kind of gets. Uh, it gets pulled apart here by the polymerase, right? And then the polymerase works through and uh, it, it adds, you know, to the RNA chain and, and it moves um, forward. But when it's doing that, what you can see, it it's, has to kind of twist the DNA here and the DNA in front gets what's what we refer to as overwound, okay? So the, the twists in this DNA are getting tighter and tighter. And then as you go back, uh, the DNA behind it is underwound. So if you, don't, uh, if you don't have any way to remedy this, uh, the polymerase would actually at some point just stop because it, it can no longer deal with that, that tension of the, under, the overwound DNA in front of it. So there, there's particular machinery to deal with this, and those are topoisomerases, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, a link uh, to visualize supercoiling. Again, I'll just keep that there in the um, the description box. I, I think this one was about two minutes long. Uh, if you if you want to just get a visual visual um, idea of of what supercoiling is. So closed cir circular DNA again uh, in the B form is termed relaxed. Okay, there's one turn uh, per about 10.5 base pairs in that, that helix. 
Okay. Changes are going to um, be due to structural strain, uh, supercoiling, um, uh, usually due to underwinding, um, and that means there are fewer helical turns. Uh, underwinding makes uh, later separation of the strands easier. And if we look in this electron micrograph, right, this would be the, the total relaxed. And then we have uh, varying degrees of supercoiling going on, uh, increasing in, in towards the right. Okay, and you can see the, the fragment that's most supercoiled is shown here that it, it's really wrapped tightly around itself. All right, so there's some terminology with supercoiling that we need to go through. And first is the linking number, or LK. Um, LK of 1 would be you know, totally relaxed DNA. Okay, and, and here we have LK of 6, and, and that denotes that it's crossing, one strand is crossing over the other strand uh, six times. Okay. This is not a very good picture um, in reality. It's not really how it looks. Um, but again, this is more of a cartoon to kind of help you understand um, what, these, what the terminology is. Right. In reality, you're not going to be looking at a picture to count the linking number. Okay. What, you'll, what you'll do is use a, a calculation. So linking number is the total number of base pairs divided by the number of base pairs per turn. Okay, so IE linking number then is really just the number of turns you have. Right, and in, in this example, well, we have a, um, if we have a, a linking number of, of 200, right, and we, um, remove two turns from that, our linking number will then be 198. Right, so if we have a relaxed B form of DNA with 2100 uh, base pairs uh, in that plasmid, we have 10.5 base pairs per turn. Uh, you do the math there uh, using that equation above, that linking number is 200. All right, the change in linking number is just going to be your current linking number minus the linking number you started with. So, yeah, right, in the, the second example here, C, we have 198, we started with 200, so our delta LK is minus two. Uh, linking number depends on the length of the plasmid, okay, because you're, you're using the total number of base pairs divided by the base pairs per turn. Uh, if you remove two turns, that delta LK is going to be negative, as we saw before. So going from 200 to 198, we get a delta LK of minus 2. If we add two turns, um, that's what we would refer to as being a, a positive supercoil. Okay? That would be uh, delta LK of plus 2. Okay? So removing turns, we get negative supercoils. If we add turns, we get positive supercoils. Uh, there's also another term called superhelical density, which is uh, abbreviated as the Greek letter sigma. It's just a measure of supercoiling, and that is the a delta LK number divided by our LK naught. Okay, so for the previous example, we had if we had negative two as a delta LK, we divide that by what we started with uh, in the relaxed form, which was 200, and that would be negative 0.01. So that, that, in a sense, is 1%. We could see that uh, that's 1% negative supercoil. Uh, in vivo, the numbers that you typically see for this are uh, negative 0.05 to negative 0.07. So that's about 5 to 7% underwound. Okay. Uh, if DNA is overwound, then it would get a positive value. But in vivo, usually it's underwound, and that's because it's easier to to unravel and and you know replicate or transcribe. Changing the linking number results in a change in supercoiling, right? Not not surprising. 
and we refer to uh, two forms of DNA that have the same sequence, but they only differ in terms of linking number uh, as topoisomers. Okay, so that term topoisomer means that we have DNA that's the same sequence, it just has different linking numbers in it, i.e. they're different super helical densities. Right, and topoisomers differ um, by linking number. They can differ, you know, by a linking number of one or ten, you know, whatever. They just have different linking numbers. Uh, so this this example from the book is shown here. Uh, right, this circle of DNA has a linking number of twenty-five. Uh, this one now is underwound. It has a linking number of twenty-three. We would refer to those as, as topoisomers. Uh, if you want to get really in detail, um, then the negative supercoil here has a, a right-handed, um, supercoil and the positive has a left-handed, but you know, I'm not going to expect you to, to know that in this case, right. right? You can actually look at the, the degree of supercoiling in DNA on a gel Compact supercoiled DNA travels faster in the gel than does um, the, you know, more relaxed um, DNA, right? Because as you supercoil it, it gets smaller and smaller. If the physical size of it, it kind of comes in compared to what it looks like when it's relaxed. So these could travel faster. Okay, and this that's just shown here on this uh, agarose gel. So we have... You know, in the first lane, we have relaxed DNA and then highly supercoiled DNA. Uh, and then if we treat it with what's known as uh, topoisomerase, uh, an enzyme that changes linking numbers, we can get, you know, bands here at, at every linking number. And so these single bands shown here are differing by a linking number of, of just one. So you, you can separate uh, DNA out when it's a change in linking number of only one, which is pretty, uh, pretty crazy. Okay. okay. Underwinding, as we've seen, most DNA in, in eukaryotic cells is underwound. Okay. And it facilitates additional structural changes. Okay. So it helps maintain structure of, of cruciforms, uh, at pallid, at pallidrome sequences. So, you know, this would be a cruciform structure that's much easier to to have when the DNA is underwound compared to when it's completely relaxed. Okay, so cruciforms don't really occur in relaxed DNA, but they do in underwound DNA. Uh, it can also help um, the formation of left-handed Z form of DNA, which we really won't discuss a whole lot in this class. We just kind of assume that all DNA is in the B form but in reality, there are some regions that are in a left-handed Z form. Okay. Um, these supercoils are only maintained if DNA is closed circle or bound by proteins. So that's another, uh, another important reason why the eukaryotic chromosomes use proteins and are bound with proteins. Right. And these topoisomerases, right, these are the enzymes that kind of alluded to, but they're enzymes that change the linking number of DNA. And why they're important? Well, uh, you know, in, in DNA uh, replication or transcription, right, you're, you're kind of going through the DNA like a zipper, unwinding it. And if you don't really deal with that extra strain you're putting on the DNA in front of you, um, as, as we mentioned before, that's going to get overwound and it's going to basically turn into a knot and you're not going to be able to continue through. So the topoisomerase enzymes kind of sit at the front there of, in this case, this is um, DNA replication, which we'll be discussing next lecture, right? And you have uh, this topoisomerase there that can uh, actually uh, help uh, cleave the DNA and unwind it in front so it, you don't get that that knot that will ultimately stop your replication. 
that there are two major types of topoisomerases. Type 1 uh, works by making a cut in one DNA strand. And, and what they can do is relax negatively supercoiled DNA, i.e. increase the linking number. Okay, and there are type 2 topoisomerases that make cuts in both DNA strands. And what they do is induce negative supercoils, uh, which would be decreasing the link uh, LK numbers. Right? And, and these type 2 actually use ATP. So E. coli, excuse me, e. coli has four topoisomerases. Um, and this is, might get a little bit confusing. Um, they have four separate topoisomerases. Topo 1 and 3 are type 1, right, meaning that they relax negatively supercoiled DNA. Uh, and topo 2 uh, is called DNA gyrase, which we'll talk more about. And it's actually a type 2 topoisomerase. Uh, eukaryotic type 2 uh, topoisomerases can't induce negative supercoils. Uh, they can only relax positive or negative supercoils. So um, there's a little bit of a difference there between bacteria and, and um, eukaryotic topoisomerases, which you know probably won't really become important in this in this class. So if we look at bacteria type 1 topoisomerase, the actual mechanism of it, they use a tyrosine residue to do this. And you'll see that the, the phosphate group that's connecting the 3' prime uh, of one base and the 5' prime of another base, that, that tyrosine, the alcohol group on the tyrosine, is going to do a nucleophilic attack there on the, the phosphate group. Okay? And that breaks it, uh, that single strand. Okay, so this mechanism pretty simple, um, right? You just have a nucleophilic attack there. You're breaking one strand of DNA. Okay, so if you're looking at the cartoon picture of this, right, the, the tyrosine here is going to be breaking this strand. Okay, and then what happens after it breaks that, the other strand can kind of be pulled through that hole. And by doing that, you're you're changing the linking number um, by plus one. Okay, you're, you're actually adding a, another turn or coil in there. Okay. After that is pulled through, then the reverse reaction can happen. You get a nucleophilic attack from the three, three prime hydroxyl to the phosphate, okay, and everything goes back. So very simple mechanism, um, and you're just changing the linking number again by plus one. If we look at topoisomerase 2, uh, bacterial, now this is, um, we also refer to this as DNA gyrase. Okay. These break both strands, the, pass the DNA segment through the break, and then you join the strands. By doing this, you're changing the linking number uh, as before, but you're changing it in increments of 2. All right. And you need ATP for this. Uh, and this is uh, a way where you can, the bacteria cells can actually uh, induce negative supercoils, which decreases the linking number. Okay, it doesn't really happen that way in eukaryotic cells. We'll mention those here in a bit. They, they do decrease the linking number, but uh, it's, uh, the way they do it, it's a little bit differently. It involves the histone proteins. So eukaryotic type 2 topoisomerases relax positive or negative supercoils. Therefore, it can increase or decrease the linking number. Okay? And again, ATP is being used in this. All right, so the mechanism of type 2 topoisomerases, okay, if we start here, we have two strands, uh, double-stranded DNA. Um, the topoisomerase is kind of wrapped around this lighter colored blue strand. Okay, the, the darker colored um, blue strand is just a, a region of DNA a little bit further away from it. Okay, that binds to 
Uh, then we get this break in DNA, the double-stranded DNA, the light blue that's uh, sort of surrounded there in the topoisomerase. Okay. When that happens, then ATP is used to pull the darker blue strand through the light blue strand, the cut in it. Right. Then we can actually... Um, fuse those uh, regions together by uh, um, using that ATP, right? And because we've pulled that through, um, we have actually changed that linking number, okay? And again, tyrosine is the residue, the, the residue in the active site there. Right, if you want to visualize these the functions of these topoisomerases, there's there are links here you can, can you can view. Right there's actually inhibitors made for topoisomerases. Right, because if these topoisomerases don't function, cells can't undergo DNA replication and they can't divide. Okay, so that's that's pretty big, right? So, what circumstances would you want this to happen? Well, if you're, you know, if you have a, a bacterial infection, right? The bacteria cells are going to be dividing much faster than, than your cells. So if you can make a topoisomerase inhibitor specific to the bacteria cells, that would be a, a very good target for an antibiotic. Okay. And some of those uh, are shown here. Okay, again, you're not going to be responsible for these structures, but um, just know that this is a target for antibiotics, okay? Um, they can also be used as chemotherapy agents, right? Because cancer cells are, are sort of rapidly growing cells. So if you can slow their, their cell division down by inhibiting their, their topoisomerase and making the division, uh, the, the replication of their genomes impossible, that'd be a, a good target for a chemotherapy drug. Okay, and so some of those uh, are shown here. So in summary, um, topoisomerases control linking number and thus the supercoiling um, in a, a segment of DNA. Okay, there are two types. Type 1 breaks one strand uh, and that changes the linking number by increments of 1. Uh, generally, it relaxes DNA by removing negative supercoils, which would increase the linking number. Type 2 break both strands and changes the linking number by increments of two. Okay. In, in bacteria cells, they are introducing negative supercoils, which decreases the linking number. Okay. They use ATP, okay. and in bacteria cells, it's referred to as DNA gyrase. Uh, eukaryotic type two topoisomerase, they can't underwind the DNA. They can't induce negative supercoils but they can both relax uh, positive and negative supercoils, but and the mechanism is the same. All right, so because of this, topoisomerase is given a, give us a mechanism for coiling or uncoiling to make chromosomes. So again, chromatin is a material that makes up chromosomes. It's complex of DNA, uh, histone proteins, and some other proteins. Right? And it's about equal mass DNA and protein, which um, you know might be kind of surprising, right? Because we think of a you know a chromosome as being all DNA, but actually uh, it's about equal protein to DNA if you're looking at the mass. Okay. So histones are proteins that that associate with DNA and allow it to become tightly wound together. Okay. Uh, what we refer to as a nucleosome, uh, that's a structural unit for packing chromatin. It consists of DNA strand round or around a uh, histone core. So if you hear that term nucleosome, what that means is you have DNA wound around histone, a uh, histone protein. Right, so if we look at a cartoon picture of this, our histone core of the nucleosome is shown here. And there are four different colored wedges. And that's because the histones are actually um, four, uh, two sets of four proteins kind of uh, bound together. 
So there are total eight histone proteins in this core. Okay. The DNA wraps around it, and then you have these linker regions of DNA that go between one of these nucleosomes to another. And that about 146 base pairs uh, of DNA are wrapped around a histone, um, just for your information. When you look at it under electron micrograph, it looks like this. kind of looks like beads on a string. Uh, the string linker uh, DNA regions between them is about 54 base pairs. Uh, the N-terminal tails of histone stick out um, to form sites for modification, um, and we'll talk about these uh, a little bit. And they also f uh, are important between um, making contacts between the nucleosomes, but they aren't, they aren't actually shown here in this picture. Okay, histones, the molecular weight, uh, can vary a little bit, but uh, about 11,000 to 21,000 uh, Daltons. They're rich in basic amino acids. So things like arginine, lysine, and uh, obviously hist histamine, um, that uh, is where they get the name histones. Uh, so, excuse me, histidine, not histamine. Um, so that's these basic amino acids. And that's important because the basic amino acids have positive charges, which can then associate with the negative phosphate charge uh, in the DNA. Uh, there are five major types. Uh, they differ in their molecular weight and amino acid composition. Um, these histone proteins can be heavily modified and those are referred to as post-translational modifications. So that occurs after the protein has been translated. And things like the adding of a methyl group, um, an ADP, uh, a, a phosphate group being added, um, sugars being added to them, uh, acetylation. So all of these things, uh, you can modify the histones and that modification actually influences DNA packing and gene regulation. Uh, modifications do change with age. And this is sort of um, an area of what's referred to as epigenetics. And that's something, um, a very new field. Uh, and it's the study of how the genes, how your genes can change uh, with respect to time or environment, um, how they, you know, the DNA code itself doesn't change, but the way the genes are expressed is what's changing. Okay. And we've referred to, we've made kind of allusions to this, how um, the topo isomerase number two in eukaryotic cells can't induce negative supercoils. Um, how, how you actually get underwound DNA in a eukaryotic cell is depicted here. So a histone protein, uh, the DNA wraps around it, and it wraps around the histone in a negative supercoil. Okay, when it does that, it actually induces a positive supercoil on that unwound part. So the unbound part, if you use a topoisomerase on it, right, to relax that, that section of, of positive supercoil. The net effect of that is, is changing the linking number by uh, minus one. And then thus you get this one net negative supercoil because you, you have a negative supercoil on the histone. Okay, so that's just, maybe it's kind of semantics, but um, you can kind of think of uh, this is how you get negative supercoiling in a, in a eukaryotic cell, even though topoisomerase can't in itself generate a negative supercoil. Right. Looking a little bit closer on this, um, the histone proteins, we have a tetramer, a, a dimer of a tetramer, if that makes sense. Okay, there are eight separate histone proteins um, I should say four separate histone proteins, and you have two copies of them. 
Okay, they're referred to here as H2A and H2B, H3 and H4. Okay, that makes up the tetramere, and then there's a dimer of it. So there, on this side, there's, uh, and you can see that the they sort of are, are flipped. Uh, H4 is matching up to the H3 on the next dimer, H3 matching up with H4, and, and et cetera. Okay. That's the, what, what the histone core, the protein makeup of the histone core looks like. Right, you might say, okay, there's H2, H3, and H4, right? The H standing for histone. There's no H1. Where's where's the H1? We'll see that in a, in a second. Um, a little bit more um, detailed or realistic view is shown here. Uh, not going to need to know this. The only thing that this shows that's good is that you have these the the sort of terminal region, the end terminal regions. You see how they stick out. Those are the regions that can be um, modified to to induce uh, different binding of the DNA or dif different gene expression. Uh, again, here's just a, an, again another more detailed view of a, a sort of crystal crystallography view of it um, with the face the space filling uh, model shown here, and you can see this blue uh, double helical DNA wrapping around that, that histone core. The DNA wraps about one and two thirds times around it. Okay, again, there's 146 bases that wrap around that histone and it's a left-handed supercoil. Histone protein H1 is actually not part of this nucleosome bead, but it sits on that that bead and it you can kind of think of it as um, a, a way to maybe lock in that that coil around that that nucleosome okay it's sort of I, I guess lock would be the the term that I would use for it um, it also binds the linker DNA region between the nucleosomes, and it helps stabilize uh, a zigzagged 30 na uh, nanometer chromatin fiber, which we'll see in a second. Okay, so that's where the H1 protein is. Okay, it's not actually part of the nucleosome bead itself, but it, it helps stabilize it from the outside. Well, what... There's, a, there's actually a specific DNA sequencing that helps bind to a nucleosome, okay? And that is uh, AT pairs. So AT base pairs allow the DNA to bend, right? GC bases don't really allow this bending as much. So the spacing is uh, you have about two or more AT bases at about 10 base pair intervals and that allows the DNA to make a, a circle. Okay, so some of these repeat regions we see in DNA are, are actually just regions that help facilitate binding to chromatin, uh, excuse me, binding to um, histone proteins to make the chromatin. All right, and the, the histone tails, as they're referred to, um, these are the, the N-terminal regions of these histone proteins. And as you can see, they do stick out quite a ways, right? And those are the regions that you get modifications to, right? And they can actually line up together to sort of um, facilitate a um, interaction between separate nu nucleosome beads. So we have, uh, once we have our DNA wrapped around our, our histone proteins to make these nucleosome cores, they can have a helical structure around themselves. Okay. And, and that's referred to as the 30, nano, 30 nanometer fiber. And that's shown here in electron micrograph. Okay, that's... Um, nucleosome formation compacting uh, DNA about sevenfold. Okay. 
there's about a hundred fold compaction here in the 30 uh, nanometer fiber. Uh, so the nucleosome, when we just wrap DNA around a, a histone protein, that's a seven fold compaction. Okay. Overall, the compaction in DNA to get in a cell is about 10,000 fold. Okay. So this nucleosome DNA wrapping around histones is only seven fold. When we get to the 30 nanometer fiber, that represents a hundred fold compaction. Okay, so you can still see there's there's more folding and compacting that needs to go on. Right, this is not over the entire chromosome. Uh, it correlates with transcriptional activity. Uh, higher order structures are still not, not that well understood. Okay, so the 30 nanometer fiber, um, there's a couple different models of it. But really, what you can think of it as just these nucleosome cores kind of making a helix around themselves. So remember this, this dark brown strand is DNA. It's in a helix, and it's getting wrapped around these, these histone proteins to make nucleosomes. So that helix is also making a helix around itself. If we look at these different orders of structures, right, we have starting with DNA with the double helix, that DNA double helix is wrapping around histones to make nucleosomes. Okay, that, that, if we look at the size of that, that's about 11 nanometers, right? If we have those wrapping and hel making a helix around themselves, right, and if we're numbering them here, the histones are numbered one through 10, they're numbered one through 10 here. Okay, this is what's the 30 nanometer fiber. Um, and then the higher order uh, structures are shown here uh, as well, um, which again, you probably don't need to know these as much um, in this class because they are, as we've said, not as well understood. But you're just making like more coils, uh, coiled coils, okay, in a sense. We can see that it is a very um, complex structure. All right, and here's an example of this. If we have our nucleosome structures here, those are just being twisted on themselves and making a, a, a secondary helical structure to make the 30 nanometer fiber. I like this figure too. I think this figure is probably one of the better ones at showing these levels of structure. Right, starting from the, the double helix, which is about two nanometers, to um, the, the nucleosome structure, which is about 11 nanometers, 30 nanometer fiber, which is nucleosomes coiled on themselves. And then that is coiled up again, right, on itself, which makes 300 nanometer. The 700 nanometer fiber is, you know, th that again, making another coil. Uh, and so forth. And then finally, when you have that, that uh, chromatid structure uh, there of the chromosome, that's the 1400 nanometer structure. Uh, a, a video to kind of view this DNA compaction and storage is shown here. Again, that's in the description. Well, these chromosome, the, the condensation of chromosome structure is maintained, right? You can, you can think of uh, you get this DNA coiled upon itself like that. There's got to be some some pretty decent potential energy in it. And if you you know did that, let it go, it might just spring out right and explode out. So there are proteins that kind of help this structure be maintained, hold it together. And they're referred to as SMC proteins, which stands for structural maintenance of chromosomes. And they have a, a basic um, structure shown here, kind of cartoon picture, where you have uh, a hinge region and then the N-terminal and C-terminal, right? And these are, are coiled coiled. These straight pieces here are referred to as coiled coils. So this would be a monomer, okay? When it, it to be active, it links with a, uh, another copy and makes a dimer, okay? Um, these are found in all organisms from bacteria to humans. There are two members of these SMC proteins. 
uh, cohesions and con- uh, condensins. Okay, cohesions keep two sister chromatids together. Condensins facilitate condensation of chromosome during cell division. Right, they bind DNA to cause DNA to be overwound or positive supercoils, and there's the role is still not completely understood. If we look at them, this would be condensin. Okay, it looks kind of like cherries, I guess, um, that dimer. Those, those ATP binding regions that we saw, those are the ones that interact and wrap DNA into positive supercoils. Okay, they'll, they'll induce these positive supercoils, right? Um, and then by doing so, you get negative supercoils on this unbound side. That's where topoisomerase 1 comes in that then cleaves those negative supercoils. And then you you lose that condensin, that condensin unbinds. And what you've done there, the net result is you've added positive supercoiling to the, the DNA. Okay, so that uh, concludes our discussion on chromosomes and, and, and genes. What we'll be discussing next time is, is DNA structure and actually the, the process of DNA replication. And we'll be moving into uh, the last three lectures discussing the central dogma of biochemistry. That is taking DNA and replicating it or being able to move DNA information to RNA information and then into protein information.